Sorry? India. India. Okay. Put that down here. Yep. Someone else? Space expression. Space expression. Some people like that. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Vulnerable. Vulnerable. Yes, sir? Cradle. Good. Can you say that in one word? System. System, okay, that'll do. That's good. I'm sure we could have spent a lot more time thinking about that image, which I'll now call Earth. Um, I wanted to make sure I didn't give it a name or anything. That's good. Now, it would be fair to say that over the last 10 or 20 years in particular, if not the last 100 years, this vulnerable, finite home of ours has been taken over by large-scale organisations. We've become a branded home planet. Now, for those of you fashion conscious, you'll realise that's the Burberry check, am I right? And that's just representative of one of the brands that is known throughout the world. And we've literally turned our planet into a brand, okay? And we are run and controlled by large-scale organisations. There is an undercurrent to all of this, of course. But while being branded and having access to all the things that we like and getting them delivered to our houses and buying Gucci and Prada and Nike, having McDonald's and Coke and all those sorts of things are good, underneath that is a rather harsh reality that perhaps we tend to push under the carpet. It might be the elephant in the room. And there are a lot of things going on here. Obesity, fries. Anybody that watched a documentary recently on McDonald's knows that they sugarcoat their fries. Ooh, great. You can get gold iPods. David Beckham has a gold iPod. You've got Coke machines that have just re re released in Asia that will dispense a free Coke if you had the machine. It's true. Go on the web and have a look at it. So they're called Hug Me. You go out there and you get a group of you together. If your arms aren't big enough, hug the machine and it'll give you free Coke all day long. It's the new life. Rich and poor. The rich, we waste, we throw things away. The poor, picking up out of the, the beams. That's Hublot, one of the most expensive watch brands in the world. They've just released that watch, which is worth about two and a half million dollars. Okay, for one watch. What would two and a half million dollars do for this child? Etc. etc. 
This is the undercurrent. So while we might think it's great that we're global, that we've got corporate brands, that we can buy and consume whenever we like, we're not really addressing some of this stuff. And this is what bothers me about what we call humanity. Because we like to think we are humanity. How many of you here have fairly young children? By a show of hands, please. I'm not going to ask any questions, just if you've got hands. How many, so only a couple of people with young children. If your child was that skinny, how would you feel when you took it to school each day, or went out shopping, or took it to a child's birthday party? How would you feel? Embarrassed, yeah? You wouldn't. <laughs> what, what, what would you do? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you'd do something, right? Because if this was right on our doorstep, and this was how our kids looked, we would not allow this to happen. This is illegal, really, but alone immoral. We would not treat our children like this. That there are millions of kids around the world like this, right now, every single day. And while there are organisations like Vision Australia and Plan that certainly do their bit to help and the Red Cross and those sorts of things, a far more fundamental problem going on that allows this to happen. And it's us. The future we face rests on the choices you make. Now, there are about 1,500 people, give or take, in this photograph. How long, in minutes, do you think it took the world's population to increase by that many people? Seconds? Yeah. Okay. So, 1,500 people? Sorry? Sorry, Aubrey? Half an hour. Half an hour. Okay, yeah, you need to speak up because I can't hear you very well up here. Anybody else want to say anything? Minutes? Ten? Two? Yeah, anybody else? Over the back here, let's have somebody. Come on. Ten. Perfect. Right answer. Well done. Ten minutes. The net increase in the world's population is about 153 people every minute. Okay? There are 7 billion of us on the planet already, if not more, and we're increasing by this much every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes. So while it might be good to have these large brands and to have all this technology and computers and laptops and telephones and all that sort of thing, and lovely clothes, more than we could ever wear, every 10 minutes, no matter what we do in terms of energy efficiency and making things more reliable, all those sorts of things, the population continues to grow and grow and grow and grow. And we live on, who said the word finite? I think it was from, yeah, gold star. We live on a finite planet, folks. Now, we may have got away with this a couple of hundred years ago when there weren't very many of us on the planet, the population has doubled in my lifetime, believe it or not. Doubled. When I was born, there were three and a half billion people on the planet. There are now over seven billion. And I'm not that old. That's ridiculous. And the only way it's going to happen is if we zip up the planet and all its natural resources into one great big urban jungle like this. More than half of the world's people now live in cities. The number of people that are starving is growing once again after a period in which they managed to stabilise it a little bit. What's more worrying is that the number of obese people is growing even faster than the starving people. So there are now estimated to be more obese people on the planet than starving people on the planet. So while we're happy to have kids that look like that previous picture, they're all gaining weight. Interesting. On a finite planet. Now, there is a calculation called the carrying capacity of the Earth. And the estimation is that in order to bring people up to the same standard of living that we have today, we would need three planet Earths to be able to sustain those people. Now, the last time I looked up in the night sky, I saw the little rock here, 
certainly did not see two more planet Earths. So how the hell are we going to fit everything we desire onto this finite planet that we are bumping up against the ceiling of? Let's switch tax a little. We're going to play a game. I need two volunteers from the audience, please. So anyone wants to just come up? It's very simple, it's just a little game. A couple of questions for you. So anyone want to volunteer? You sir with the glasses, if you'd like to just come up to the front and you sir, thank you very much. So two stages to it. So yeah, if you just come up the steps here, that would be great. Give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. What's your name, sir? Nick, I am Nick, nice to meet you. Raphael, fantastic. Okay, Nick, Raphael. You're two suspects in a crime, okay? You've been caught bang to rights. Do they look like criminal types, do you think? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Very shady. I noticed they were sitting apart, I reckon, that was on purpose. I'm the police. I've got enough evidence to put these guys away for five years of hard labour, assuming they don't confess, alright? Five years. However, if I can get them both to confess, they'll go to jail for ten years. So Nick, Raphael, just have a quick word with each other. Do you want to confess or not confess? Alright, time's up. What are you going to do? So, you're not going to confess? You sure? Okay. Alright. So I've got enough evidence to send you over five years and going to keep quiet, yeah? Okay, Nick, can you come over here for a second? So I've just, give, just made a bit of a deal. Just giving them a moment to think about it separately. Trust. Listen. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The core of it is trust, right? I won't take any more questions, so we can talk about this at the end of the class. So let's do the great reveal. Nick, I didn't do it honest. <laughs> Raphael, I didn't do it honest. There you go. Give them a round of applause. They call it, thank you guys, you can go now, thank you. Um, they cooperated and they decided to trust each other, which is excellent because they just kept quiet despite that very attractive deal that they offered. And so they stuck to their guns and they're going to jail for five years. Sorry, guys. This is known as the prisoner's dilemma. Okay? If you consider player A's best response regardless of what player B does, okay? So player A, if you assume player B was to confess, then you're either going to go to jail for 10 years or you're going to get 20. So if you think player B is going to confess, your best option is to confess. Player B, if you think player B won't confess, then you're either going to go to jail for two years, which is a win, or you're going to get five. In either case, your best choice is to confess. You switch it around, it's the same deal. So that's the prisoner's dilemma. No matter what happens, your best option is to confess and get five years, even though two was on the table. Because you just don't know what the other person is going to do. And it comes down to trust. Now, if we consider this on a global scale, with seven billion participants in that game, every single minute, every single day, the future we face rests on the choices you make. So someone has more than you. So you think, hmm, envious, jealous perhaps, aspiring, want more than them. Look at the ultra-rich. The Sunday Times published their richness of the top 1,000 people in the UK last weekend. 414 billion pounds between them. A significant increase than what it was last year, despite the so-called recession. They're getting even richer. There are riches to be had. Having done my neurolinguistic programming courses, I've been to a lot of these seminars, it's all about getting as much as I can for myself quite often. It's selling, selling, selling. It's actually very similar to the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, and I've simplified it a little bit here. And hot is one of the words that I came up with a few years ago that I use when I'm managing teams and inspiring people. Anyone want to hazard a guess as what hot might stand for? Nope. Okay. Honest, open, transparent. Three words that sometimes we have in a different order. However, honest, open, transparent, in my opinion, is the hot that we should all aspire to be. Especially kids. I've got a great blog on this on my website, and I think if everybody taught their kids that this is the kind of hot to aspire to, we would start to create a much better world. Because, hey, I want to be hot. No matter how old I am, I can be hot for as long as I want. There's a lot of us who are in this take, take, take situation. We might think we're doing a bit of good here and there. But ultimately, we've got to ask ourselves a question. Is it good for me? Is it good for others? Is it good for the planet? And I'd say that most of us are not making those kind of decisions on a daily basis. And I know that I'm, I'm the same as you. I'm not. You know, sometimes I go to McDonald's. I shouldn't ever go to McDonald's. Sometimes I'll drink a bottle of Coke. There should be no such product as Coke on this planet in the state that we're in. It's a bad product, but we allow it to go on. What we need is more people to be hot and to start spreading the word and start changing their actions and leading by example and being the new global leaders that we need. And I'm not talking about the politicians that we have in government at the moment. I'm not talking about the Clive Palmers and the Reinhardts and the Murdochs and the Bernie Ecclestons of the world who are just intent on growing their pot for themselves. We need to help and educate them, because at the moment, most of us are on the tape. And unfortunately, this is what we're facing, increasing crisis, conflict, and chaos. It is coming. So I've created this little patchwork quilt. 
because underneath being hot, for me, we've got to have this fabric to our existence. These, no, we're human beings above all else, which is what I want to get to today when you're talking about technology and future and science and that sort of thing. We are the human beings, okay? And only by adopting these values and really, really standing up for them. Even if sometimes it means having a bit less for yourself. It's the only way this is going to happen. Because the only other way it's going to happen is going to be massive chaos, conflict, and crisis. So let's look at some of the topics for this weekend as we wrap up. Extending life. Now, I don't mind if we improve health outcomes. I don't mind if you know, Aubrey succeeds in finding ways to extend our lifetime for perhaps 100, 150, 200 years. It would be great. If we know what we're going to do with the additional time. Because by a show of hands, the average age is so that so say it's 80 years old at the moment. Who wants to live to at least 80 years? So hopefully all of you, please, please participate in this one. I just want to filter it down. Who wants to live? Keep your hands up if you want to live to at least 90. So you don't want to... Listen? Sorry? It's okay, it's my question from my one. You can deal with it if you want to support free, that's good. So, madam, you don't want to live to 90? Okay, alright, that's good. Any, do you want to live to at least 100? 110? 120? 130? Some way you're in now, 140? Okay, 150? Yeah, we've still got quite a few takers there. Okay, that's good. You'll put, put your hands down. We don't need to know how far it goes. And the thing is, it's not just how long you live, it's the quality of that life as well, which is where Aubrey hopefully is uh, alluding to. Now, the thing is, if we create that technology, if, if, you know, if we create, say, new vaccines and, and uh, cures for cancer and that sort of thing, eventually we'll all benefit, and I'm all for that. That's fantastic. Some of the benefits maybe of extending life may cost so much money that it's only the rich and powerful that will have access to it, at least initially. And they're going to be the ones that want it, right? Because the Bernie Ecclestons and, you know, sorry to name names, but Ryan Martz and Clive Palms of this world, I don't know how much longer he can live with those chins. Um, but they're the ones that are going to have the big money to, to pay this. So you have to ask yourself the question, are you amongst those people? And for some of these things, we are, because we are the rich, really. We are that 1%, even if it doesn't feel like it sometimes. So I think if we're looking at extending life, we just need to think of it in that perspective. What would we do with that? extra life and extra quality of life. Artificial intelligence. We are the human beings and we have wisdom. I'll just read out a quote here. This came from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis um, held in Vienna, Austria. A senior officer from the United Nations closed his presentation by saying, I've dealt with many different problems around the world and I've concluded that there's only one real problem. Over the past hundred years, the power that technology has given us has grown beyond anyone's wildest imagination, but our wisdom has not. If the gap between our power and our wisdom is not redressed soon, I don't have much hope for our prospects. Which I thought was an interesting idea. So, let's look at that in terms of artificial intelligence. I think it's a fantastic thing. We can inevitably increase the power of computers and the ability to calculate and formulate and forecast and predict. My background is maths and stats and marketing, and we use that for customer profiling and all those sorts of things, and it's, it's, it's good if used in the right way. However, will it solve the problems associated with a finite planet? Where's the wisdom in those decisions? So if we're gonna get behind something like this, or any of you in the audience are actually in this field, don't do it just for yourself, don't just do it for money, glory, whatever, immortality. How is it going to affect 7 billion people on the planet? And in many respects, people that benefit first, again, will be the rich and powerful. You've got a question, are you among them? Space. 
Who said space exploration? That's the FG model, yeah, excellent. Space exploration is one of my favourite topics. And I'm quite often tweeting and saying what a load of rubbish all the money that's spent on that is. Because it takes 6.26 billion joules of energy for a 100 kilo person, which is roughly what I am, to get into space. All right? Well, the energy that you get if you ate 3 million Big Macs. All right? And that's assuming I'm not wearing anything other than maybe a light suit to protect me from having no air. It takes a lot of energy to get anything into space. It is not surprising that Richard Branson's investment in Virgin Galactic was $200,000 a seat for a 15-minute joyride. Anyone in the room booked up for that? Because there's a few thousand that are. So anybody here today is one of those people? Didn't think so. It's the rich and the powerful, right? People with the money. Again, are you among them? How many people do you think we're going to get off this planet in the foreseeable future? <laughs> you know, NASA, if you go to their website and read their papers, the only propulsion systems that work for them at the moment are chemical. So mixtures of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, those sorts of things. The only thing they can think of right now that could be as powerful is nuclear. And they recognise that no one wants to be sitting on top of a nuclear bomb to get up there. So that's kind of there. There's actually a paper on their website that recommends that some of their budget should be allocated to blue sky research. And they've actually named warp drive technology and direct control of gravitation. I can't see that happening very soon. Even if someone who quite likes Star Trek, I can't see it happening that soon. And even if it does, how many people are we going to get off this place? Remember what the slider showed you earlier? Every 10 minutes, there's another 153 people. So who's going to get off this planet while well, it's being zipped up? There'll be 8 billion of us, then 9 billion of us. Does anybody have any concept of how many people 7 billion is? Like, if I was to give you a $1 coin for every single person on the planet, how long do you think that line of $1 coins would be? And let's assume we're in Melbourne, we're going to drive to Sydney and back. <laughs> side by side. So just in the long line. Good, good, good question. So in a long snaking line of $1 coins all the way to Sydney and back, how many times do you think you would have to do that drive to get through all 7 billion $1 coins? So let's just think of it in terms of round trips. How many round trips, Melbourne to Sydney, do you think it could take? Six? Speak up nice and loudly. Yep, six. Any other offers? Six? We've six, six, got six so far? Fifth. Sorry? Fifth. A fifth? Fifty. Fifty, yep, thank you. So we've got six, now fifty. Anyone? Ten thousand. It's not that big. Fifty's, fifty's warm. Anyone else want to? Yes, sir. Two hundred. Two hundred. It's a little bit big, so between fifty and two hundred. Any more? Sorry? 75, a little bit higher than 75, 100. So you would have to drive from Melbourne to Sydney 100 times just to get through the 7 billion people on the planet if they all represented a $1 coin. That's how many of us are here already. Now the interesting thing about that is if you do that at 100 kilometers an hour, it will take you nearly three months to do that. Okay? And it will actually end on March the 24th, which happens to be my birthday, funnily enough. Um, and that's when we'll finish back here in Melbourne. There is only one problem. In the three months that it took you to do that journey, we've been adding 153 minutes. So you'd have to drive halfway back to Sydney again to welcome all the new people that have arrived on the planet in the three months it took you just to say hello to the 7 billion that are here already. It's enormous. And we've really got to start thinking that way. You know, while we're sitting in a room with maybe 100 of us, you think, that's okay, I'll go out of here, I'll go to shopping and Maya and whatever I'm going to do afterwards. It doesn't make any difference. Seven billion of us trying to do the same thing, it's a nightmare. You know, I'm at Melbourne Business School at the moment, and one of our lecturers is rubbing his hands because he's a consultant for Louis Vuitton. And they're rubbing their hands at the prospect of another 500 million young Chinese women in China who are going to have access to their bags. And they're forecasting doubling, tripling, and quadrupling of sales of Louis Vuitton bags over the next 10 years. What good is that, really? 
And that's what we're facing. So, space. So I'll conclude today, and then we'll take some questions. And this, this is just a couple of the areas that we need to be thinking about if we're going to improve technology and artificial intelligence and extend our life and all these things to do with humanity plus, with an emphasis on the plus. Electric power is the way to go and it needs to be plentiful, it needs to be cheap, environmentally friendly, we need to be off fossil fuels, it needs to be readily available worldwide. So much electricity now is lost in just the transmission of it to your house. Technology, cheap, modular, long-lasting. Now I've got my smartphone, I've got my iPad, and it's, they're sealed. I can't upgrade them without throwing that one out and buying another one. We've got to get away from this mentality. You should be able to price the back of a Mac off and be able to pop in a new processor. You know, you can do that with PCs, I know. Everything should be available. Even cars, you know. Keep a car for a few years, as long as the body's okay, go in, plug in a new engine, off you go again. You know, we should be having that kind of mentality. Food. Stop expecting food to be available to us all year round when it's seasonal. <laughs> seasonal. So we should be producing locally, we should have seasonal products, and if it's not seasonal, we should get used to not having it. Natural, organic, sustainable, preservative free. China at the moment is buying huge amounts of land in Africa, throwing people off of their own land and destroying their villages and a few of them are then being offered jobs to go and work on those farms to produce great food that goes straight back to China. And the Middle East are doing that too. We live in a country where everything is adapted to not having water. All the species, all the plant life, even the aboriginals, adapted to low water usage. And then we came along. So no more. Recycling. I live in an apartment block and it's incredible to see the amount of recycling that goes on and the lack of motivation for people to separate something as simple as cardboard from waste when they've got clearly marked bins. And when I go down to my car, which I don't use very often, because I try and walk wherever I can, I take the plastic bags and other bits and pieces out of the cardboard box because it's stupidity. And the building managers put up big signs saying, please help us help you to recycle. Somebody in the building just doesn't care. How's it? We're obsessed with housing. Some people say we're in a bubble and the housing's going to collapse. Not interested in any of that in itself. Quality, energy efficient houses, medium cost. I'm in the South Bank area. The apartment blocks that are going up at the moment are becoming more and more and more luxurious and more and more and more expensive. It's like a competition to outdo each other with every single apartment block that's being built. And yet, what that does is push ordinary people, let's say, for want of a better term, out. Further and further out to the suburbs where they're going to rely on cars and maybe some form of public transport if Melbourne can get it right. We've got, to, we've got to stand up and tackle some of these things. The future we face, there's so many choices you make. Because at the end of the day, there is absolutely no escaping the fact, and some of the words that are listed here, this is finite, and the chances are we are not going anywhere else soon. So what are we going to do about it? Okay. Because the power is in your hands to make choices. I would ask you to repeat with me the future you face rest and the choices you have. Yeah. A bit cheesy. But it is. We've only got this one planet and we need to look after it. So that's me. So thank you very much for your attention this morning, and I hope that was an interesting warm-up. I'm the Devil's Inquisitor, so you can go to devilsinquisitor.com and read some more about my thoughts and take on the world. Join me on Twitter, LinkedIn, for the Rationalist Society of Australia, which I'm a board member, and um, trying to help get more evidence-based decision-making out there in the world. So thank you very much indeed, and we'll thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
going out to a break after the question time, and also we have one for Coral Road Institute. So um, I'm going to pass the microphone to Tim, and he's going to uh, pass the microphone to everybody, anybody who needs a question. Uh, okay? Okay. What about the potential for harvesting asteroids? That's not finite, is it? It's not finite, no. And, and, and I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on asteroids. I have read a little bit recently. I know James Cameron is one of those people that's interested in getting up there and mining them. Um, it goes back to the energy it takes to get even one person up there, let alone travel out there and travel back and all those sorts of things. So if we can do it in a way that benefits us, fine. If it just contributes to this problem and goes towards increasing consumption, you're only delaying getting another brick wall, as far as I'm concerned. However, let's see what James Cameron is going to do. Okay. Um, so, I've got a question that relates the beginning of your talk to yeah. the end of it. Um, I thought it was very interesting and very imaginative that you started off giving a description and demonstration of the prisoner's dilemma. Because I think that the simplistic interpretation of the rest of your presentation and the, the interpretation that most people give to uh, discussions of the finite nature of planets and so on ultimately lead people to conclude, most people, that the best thing for us to do is to adopt what some people call the precautionary principle and essentially um, uh, put big brakes on technology. Uh, but, well, just to use the, use the example of life extension, which you did, um, of course, the uh, downside of putting a break on that is that lots of people have to die a horrible and um, premature death who wouldn't have to if we developed technology more quickly. Um, so the prisoner's dilemma argument is quite interesting in that regard. Um, I wonder what you would like to say about the possibility that the right answer to the questions that you put up is more general than the last slide, where you sort of talked about you know, cheap technology and so on. In other words, that actually we should be pursuing all of these technologies like um, postponing aging and artificial intelligence and so on with all haste, but with one eye all the time on how to make them cheap and universally available and all that sort of thing, as opposed to the other interpretation of just not developing them at all. Hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what exactly? <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm pro-technology. I think that definitely we, we should all have access to the technology that makes our lives easier. And, you know, I think it is, you're quite right, Aubrey, it is time to move away from that, either block technology or, you know, go forward and solve the consequences. There is grey in between, and this is where I have spent a lot of time thinking that so much of, you know, like what we're doing here today is all technology-based. And there are so many good aspects of technology, and what I'm saying is that if we are going to pursue this technology advancement, it needs to be done with one eye on the fact that we're a finite planet, and it needs to be for the betterment of all. I mean, if we can get smartphones and laptops into the hands of every person, every child, and allow them to have access to information that increases awareness of our problems, bring it on. Absolutely. So I'm pro-technology, definitely. Uh, I'll, let the, I'll let the speaker pick the questioners. So you want to whoever you want to ask the next question? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, I'm 57, I'm the average age of a farmer in Australia and I'm a farmer, as well as a life extensionist. So in terms of food security, the lack of recruitment of uh, people into agriculture, particularly in this country, I see um, perhaps thought needs to be given to that, first yes. and foremost. Secondly, um, I was surprised not to see any mention of population control. Yes. There's a great fear of a massive population, but I think I read somewhere um, not too long ago that if uh, we'd stopped when modern contraceptive was invented, with decent wealth redistribution, Every person on this planet would be living at about the level of the Europe prior to the GFC. Mm -hmm. And um, I take it that people are, it seems that some people, I'm just going to make, this sounds awful, 
I don't mind taking a flap. It seems that some cultures produce people that convert food into their own um, corporeal extension and others convert it into six kids. Either way, the problem is the same, human biomass. And um, I would like to hear your views on control of population. I say this because at one point I supported a child in Haiti. I learned that the average uh, young girl in Haiti back then probably has six kids. What am I supposed to do to support seven? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And there are some topics that, given the time today, I have avoided climate change being one um, that could have been brought up. So, population is a good one. I mean, I've always admired Sir David Attenborough, or is he Lord Attenborough now? I can't remember. Um, and, um, you know, he really is a proponent of reducing human population. You know, he's actually involved in an organisation whose sole aim is to cap it. Yeah. 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 So, so in terms of population, it is a really difficult one, and all, all, intentionally because it's, it's a whole hour on its own. So, I guess in, in, in summary, my, my views would be that we're increasing by 153 a minute. I can't see that that's going to change. It is well known that if you educate females in third world countries, they tend to have less children. And I think that the work that's going on in that area, I think Bill Gates is involved in that, is good. Because we don't need to have that mentality so much anymore of having a workforce that you actually produce for yourself, which is what the mentality has been. So it's, it's a very difficult one. I don't think that we should cap it. We may even get a natural crisis that will cap it for us. Who knows? You know, I'm, I've got no doubt that there are probably some super viruses out there that are just on hold ready to be used by a country that wants to flex its muscles at some point to protect its own food supply. I mean, it, you can go so many different ways with this. Um, I just stick to the fact we've got 7 billion at the moment and it's increasing. What are we going to do about that as a whole? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Okay. It's a big topic, I know. Yes, sir. Okay, so I wanted to come back to the point that you made regarding technology and choices and our technological development possibly outstripping our sophistication when it comes to making rational choices about how we should proceed. One of the slides was about life extension clearly and about life extension resulting in population growth, though, however, there is the trend where, with, as you mentioned, increasing education, people not only have fewer children, there tends to be a greater gap between generations, and obviously population growth is not really dependent on longevity, it's simply dependent on the number of children per person and the duration between generations. So that's one example where technology, in terms of education and connectivity, actually changes the equation, and another example is obviously the internet. So, would it be your position that part of the really important role of technology here is not to give us shiny options, but actually to improve the way that we communicate and make decisions? So it's not us versus the technology, it's us with the technology. I agree. Yeah, that's a simple answer to that one. You've, you've understood and it's encapsulated very well. Yeah, yeah. good, thank you. Hello, get the back. Yeah, that's you, yeah, no one else behind you. <laughs> oh, you're a gentleman, I can't see you from spot. Uh, no, you're a gentleman, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, two questions. First of all, uh, re, uh, the calculation that we've only got room on Earth for something like a third of seven billion at our current standard of living. That seems a bit low to me. How do you calculate that? I'm just quoting the organisation that has calculated the carrying capacity based on if we all had this equivalent standard of living. So if all 7 billion people on the planet live to the standards that we enjoy here in Australia, you'd need three planet Earths to sustain them. So is that a physical limit or just at our present level of technology? It's everything. So it's the use of resources. 
it's the land mass that we need, it's the amount of food production that we need, it's the way we use our water, it's everything taken into account. So if you type carrying capacity in on the internet, you'll find the papers and the organisation that does it. Okay. Yeah. It's very interesting. And the uh, second question, the uh, space, uh, how much how much energy does it did it take to uh, fire up the LHC last year? Sorry? How much energy did it, did it take to fire up the LHC last year? The Large Hadron Collider? No idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer. The shitload for those of you who didn't quite hear that. Yeah. Gentleman there next. Behind you. Yeah, uh, next door to the person. Yeah. Uh, can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, the future depends on our choices. I question the reality and wisdom of such choices. From the standpoint of self-responsibility, that is the radical, absolute responsibility of each social self to each social self, transcending causal and moral blame, which views the predicament of each social self as a blinkered and conditioned subjective self cast into a material and social universe which is simultaneously transient, dangerous and purposeless which situation is peculiarly the problem of each social self? I have no idea what you just said, <laughs> to, be, to be fair. If you won't come and talk to me afterwards, that's fine. That was such a long sentence. <laughs> I've forgotten the beginning of it by the time we got to the end, so I'm not meaning to be flippant. But... Gentlemen over on the left here. So the mic will come to you. You speak up. Out of all the, the people I know, um, many of them, they don't want to go to space, they don't want to live forever, uh, they don't want anything other than average life. Um, and that's it's not right or wrong, but it would be un almost unethical to convert them to our way of thinking unless it's their own choice. Yeah. Uh, so maybe the problem isn't as serious as you say, uh, maybe only a small fraction of the population actually wants this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's possible, and I guess the, that's a good question. Thank you. And I don't have figures to hand in terms of surveys about how many people would actually like it. I know we've got this lady in the front wants to go to space. Um, hands up if you want to go to space. Just, just, oh, cool. Yeah, okay. So I guess if Richard Branson was offering $100 tickets on his flight, we'd all be signed up, up including me. So, because I think it would be just fabulous to see it. I think it would be good for us, for a start, to go up there and look down on this place. So, I'd be all for, somehow, getting us all up there. And I know there's a company in Asia at the moment that's designing a lift to the moon. And it will take eight days in this lift. It will be like a shaft that connects the planet to the moon. And it will take eight days to travel there and get back. Who's afraid of heights, um, and he's told me he never, he never wants to go to space. It scares the fuck out. I wouldn't want to go in an elevator for eight days when it could be broken off at any. Oh, mind boggling. There is a company that's developing it. Right? <laughs> anyway, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. You've had your hand up for a while. I recognise that. So we'll go to you first, and then we'll get round. Um. You are uh, for technology, so am I, but only to the good side of it. Uh, it can be turned to evil just as well. But the point is, um, it's been corrupted by those people who've turned it into a fashion industry, and we, we have generated tremendous waste. We've used far too many resources getting it, and then we waste it. We don't know how to recycle it. So the people who turned it into a fashion industry in order to make just, just make money out of it, you seem to be connected fairly well to them through your work. So why do they think that way when they know the problems that it causes? Do yeah. they just not think about it? Or is it greed? Or is it just convention? Or what? Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question. I really like that. And, and as someone who has worked in various marketing roles for the last 20 odd years, um, and I'm doing my Masters in Marketing at Melbourne Business School at the moment, and, and it, oh, it frustrates the hell out of me how manipulative, in a negative sense, marketing is. And we kind of know it, and yet we fall for it, and we behave 
accordingly. And one thing I've been tweeting about recently quite, well, two, two things have come to my mind. Target testing, okay? It drives me insane, it's bullshit. Because if you go on their website, they don't even define what it says. Their whole marketing slogan is, if it's target tested, you can trust it, basically. And it's like, what? What, what, what did you do to test it? You got it out of the bag, sniffed it, and it felt right? You know, I mean, what's target tested for Christ's sake? It's rubbish. And yet we fall for it, and you can find consumers going out there and suddenly believing in target. The next one, Dawn French. What the hell has she got to do with flybys? You know, I know, having worked for Coles, how much money they pay these people. I've seen some of the invoices. And the amount of money it must take to get Curtis and Dawn French to represent Coles is disgusting. It's disgusting. And they are quite happy to sell their souls because I liken it to someone who is um, being forced a confession. So any celebrity endorsement of a product is no different from someone who's being forced to confess something. Okay? One of them does it for money, one of them does it to maintain life. Neither of them necessarily have any belief in what they're saying. They're just saying what they're told. They, what they think wants to be heard. And, it, and it has, I mean, I'm an anti-marketer in some cases because it is a corrupt system. You know, and I, I worked for several different companies where you see how much money top executives are paid and yet they display the characteristics of a psychopath. And there's lots of information out there on the internet about the sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies of people that are our supposed leaders. So again, we have to stand up to that. And one of the ways is like, for, for instance, Coke. Stop buying Coke. And it may sound silly, however, if you stop buying Coke and you tell everybody you know that you've stopped buying Coke, eventually it will spread. And it's just a case of, are we willing to do it? They sell 1.7 billion beverages a day. And if you read their annual report, they have recognised as a massive risk for them water scarcity, because water is the main ingredient in their product. You know, and if you've got half a litre of Coke, it probably took about five or six litres of water to create that half a litre of Coke, which is shit. And they recognise it as a risk to corporate profits. You know, it's written there in black and white. They know the problem. We can only change this by saying no to those sorts of products. And we just have to make a decision to stop doing it. Okay, Adam, one more question. Who's got their hand up most enthusiastically? I think him, yeah? Someone's pointing and endorsing your hand. Okay. Thank you whoever was pointing at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was pointing, it was friendly. It was definitely friendly to me. No. <laughs> Thank you, I think. Um, you talk about the increase in world population yeah. and you say that you don't think that is going to change and yet you acknowledge ways in which we know that birth rates and such can be massively changed by things like educating women and raising, you know, social education and that sort of thing. Yeah. Why is it that you don't think that reducing population growth is a, an achievable goal and worth working on? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I'm glad that you've got confused by what I said there because population will continue to increase even as we slow down the rate of growth. And the rate of growth itself will slow down. However, the population will increase in the foreseeable future. I mean, the United Nations and other bodies like that still believe it's going to be 8 billion and 9 billion before it starts to plateau in some way. So that's what I mean is the population will increase, the rate of growth is where we need to tackle it, so at least it caps out somewhere. Yeah, does that make more sense? But if, you, if we decrease the birth rate, then it doesn't magically stop decreasing when it reaches parity. I don't see why it's not possible for the for that to result in the global population decreasing. Yeah. yeah, and some forecasts show that after 2050 or even a bit later, it might, if it plateaus, it might actually come down a little bit. Um, and then it's more about demographics. More of us will be aged than young, so there'll be more people trying to be retired than actually working and paying taxes and that sort of thing. So yeah, hopefully we can reach a cap and maybe even bring it down a little bit. I mean, that would be great. And on the subject of us being old and dependent and that sort of thing, as I understand it, that's exactly what Aubrey is looking to solve. 
Absolutely. Yeah, so if we are going to live longer, then with good quality of life, so we can actually still be contributing in a good way, positive way, for the future of the planet as a whole. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Good. All right. Great questions, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this morning. We've passed back over to Adam, and then I think we do a break. Okay, we've got a break now. So, got... <laughs> thank you very much, Drew. It was an awesome talk, and I think um, we've got a lot of seats to think about during the next talk. And I, I, I do understand that it actually relates to a lot of the, the talks in, uh, that we've got planned over the next couple of days. So, we've got a break. It's actually a half an hour break. Um, is that too long? Yes. So, then, in the interests of possibly losing time later, how about we start at um, 11.15? Is that okay? 11.20, okay? 11.20, right? So, yeah. So, come in at 11, uh, between 11.15 and 11.20 and get settled outside, uh, get to know each other, shake each other's hand, and um, after all, it's a Humanity Plus conference. It's also about the humans. It's not just about video cameras and YouTube and technology and, and laptops. Okay, so you can go out there and um, extend your...